Stanford University. Okay, uh, thank you, Jeff. I'm excited to be here today and to be able to talk to you a little bit about our work on wastewater and thinking about it as a resource instead of always thinking about it in the negative sense as a liability. Uh, before I get into uh, where we're going, I want to talk a little bit about where we've been. Uh, it's amazing for people to think about that we had something like 15,000 bioreactors treating wastewater at the turn of the century in the United States alone. So we have to think that there are maybe 60,000 globally uh, bioreactors. This is the largest application of biotechnology in the world. How did these reactors get built? Well, really they came about initially because people were desperate for a solution and they just fooled around and uh, tried things and hit on some solutions that seemed to work. And then eventually uh, principles of reactor engineering were introduced and this allowed uh, some solutions to problems of organic pollution and nutrient, uh, nutrients in wastewater. <clears throat> Later in the uh, latter part of the last century, toxic substances became more of an issue and there was more attention paid to how to deal with those uh, and there were some successes there as well in, in, in taking care of those kind of problems. If we think about the design world that engineers lived in and uh, in which these wastewater treatment plants were built, before 2000, it was a world where everything was sort of linear. Uh, we weren't thinking about a lot of reuse, a lot of, uh, there were some a few exceptions, but mostly not thinking about reuse and reclamation. Uh, energy was basically a cheap commodity. There was no, really no concern about climate change at that time. And of course, the situation now is quite different. And it means that now we've got to change. And there are a whole lot of drivers for change right now. And I'm just going to list a few of those. One is, of course, as you're all aware, uh, increased water scarcity. Another is the cost of energy has gone up. Climate change has become urgent. Uh, there's an increasing need for nitrogen removal. As many of you are aware, uh, there's the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. We've got lots of, lots of situations where nitrogen is fertilizing freshwater uh, lakes or the coastal regions and creating uh, problems there. The infrastructure that was used, that was built in the 60s and 70s, now has reached its design line. So it needs to be replaced. And the question really isn't whether or not we're going to replace it. It's question is whether we're going to replace it in a smart way or a stupid way. And there are also new contaminants that we're recognizing now that need to be addressed and, and, and technology that needs to be developed for those. Lastly, uh, we have now a lot more science uh, than what we had back in the 70s. There's also new tools for understanding how these systems work. At that time, there was the, many of these things were just black boxes. And now we have opportunities for innovation where before it wasn't possible because there was not the knowledge base that there is now. So I want to talk about three projects that were initiated with uh, Woods funding here today. First is, um, I'm going to mention is about microbial ecology of nitrogen removal from wastewater. This was a project that we carried out at the, with the city of Palo Alto as our partners. Chris Francis, um, environmental microbiologist, was a um, partner and collaborator on that project. Another project I want to talk about is nitrogen removal using a catalytic converter and biotechnology coupled. And a partner on that one, a collaborator is Brian Cantwell from Aeronautics and Astronautics. So this may be the first time you hear about an environmental engineer teamed with a rocket scientist. And then the last one I'll talk about is economics of resource recovery from wastewater and now working with Frank Wallach and a team on that. And in fact, I'm going to begin the talk today with, with that, uh, with that one, that last one, most recently funded one. So it's, we haven't moved very far into it compared to the others, but uh, uh, I think it's a good place to begin, is to begin it, uh, with, with the work with Frank. And this is the wastewater resource recovery team that we put together. And I'm just showing the, the people uh, that are around the table. We're meeting um, every couple of weeks now. There's a few others that have been joining the group. But I want to point out a few people in this uh, slide. Uh, in, in particular, you see it's Phil. Phil Bobel is from the wastewater treatment plant Palo Alto. Um, Tom Zichterman there is from, and Marty Laporte are from uh, Stanford Water Utilities. And then we've got Frank, who's a, I've mentioned as an economist, and Josh, his postdoc, who's an economist. And then uh, Yoon Jung and Sebastian are working with me. Uh, they're engineering students. 
So we have a team there, and Wei Min is also is a research associate working with me. So we have a team there of engineers, economists, and people who are trying to solve the problems at this local scale of wastewater uh, and water treatment. So let's think about what wastewater is. Mostly wastewater is water. It's 99.9% .9 pure water, okay? It's also a lot of biodegradable organic matter in there, and there's nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. And those parts of the wastewater, we could think of those as resources that could be recovered and have value. There's other parts, uh, the pathogens, the salt, the refractory organics, which we need to get rid of. But if we think of this as a production process where we're going to produce useful things, and any kind of production process will have things that have to be removed in order to have a high quality product. And this is no, no different than that. So if we look at the value of the resource, wastewater resource, I like these numbers from Willy Verstrada. He's a colleague, um, a Belgian engineer, who um, worked out per cubic meter the value of the different components of wastewater. And you'll see there organic soil conditioner. This is, he is uh, uh, like compost or biochar that can be recovered from a wastewater. And per every cubic meter of wastewater, there's about a tenth of a kilogram of that material present that can be recovered. And there's the cost, the, the amount of, now I had to convert his euros into dollars, okay. So I hope I did that right. But anyway, uh, so we have about two cents per cubic meter for that organic soil conditioner, or per thousand gallons, about, um, about 10 cents uh, per, cube, per thousand gallons. And then if we move on down, we see methane. If we look at the dollars per thousand gallons, about 25 cents a thousand gallons. Nitrogen, 20, uh, roughly 25 cents. Phosphorus, five cents. And water, a dollar 20. So, uh, so you can see that the real winner here in terms of value when we look at regular sewage is water. We want to get the water out of it because that's a high value product. So one way we can think about that is through a process we which is called scalping, which an interesting concept that maybe you can take water directly from a sewer and say you remove just the carbon part of that. Now the carbon part could be removed in various ways. There's a lot of different technologies we can think about. We'd want to do it probably the cheapest way we could and the most efficient way. And then you could, any residual organic matter could go right back to the sewer. Now water that comes out of that process would still have nutrients in it and could be useful for some applications like landscape and agriculture. Now if you want to go to a higher level of uh, water quality, then we'd want to remove those nutrients and then those could presumably go back to the sewer if need be, any, or any waste that's coming from that process. And then you could use the water for a high, higher level purpose. And then lastly, is salt removal. And uh, if you want a really high level uh, application, say for example, uh, aquifer storage or cooling, uh, then you might want to remove the salts, and it turns out that removing salt from treated wastewater is a whole lot less expensive than removing salt from seawater. So this could be a, a, a nice application. So um, we're thinking about these distributed scalping facilities for water reuse and local uh, water recovery and local reuse within a catchment. And let's see what I mean by that. So here's like here's a uh, here's what we would call a uh, a catchment and it has a treatment plant at the end, so the, the sewers conduct the water down to the treatment plant, and then in this case, sh showing discharge to the ocean. And we could imagine that there would be scalping facilities located strategically around uh, this, uh, along the system. And those, those facilities could harvest water and reuse, allow local reuse of that water, for, say for example, for non-potable applications. Okay. And we would call those, we call those clusters, and um, of course you're going to end up with some salt coming out of that. And the overall system we would call a catchment, uh, would be a name for it. So we have households that, uh, it, that, or buildings, that many buildings together form clusters, and many clusters together form a catchment. And the catchment is basically the service area of the wastewater treatment plant, is how we're thinking about it. So what would happen what would be the impact of widespread water reuse uh, if we think of it across scale? So you can imagine doing water reuse, uh, say for example, gray water, reusing it at a scale of a building. And we're uh, contemplating something like that for the Stanford Green Dorm. Okay, so we can imagine that there'd be reuse at that scale. And then if we just move up the scale, 
The next scale up would be the cluster that I just talked about. So this would be small cities, homeowners associations. Um, it could be um, um, campuses like Stanford. Okay, so there's the Stanford campus. So that next scale up. So it's a cluster of buildings. We could think of it that way to create the campus. And then the next scale above that would be the catchment scale, where we have medium to large cities, regional wastewater collection, and per perhaps large farms would fall there, maybe 100,000 to 500,000 individuals. So this would be, say, for example, the service area of the city of Palo Alto, wastewater collection system. And then the next scale up would be a watershed, where you maybe have multiple cities and water districts and irrigation districts, greater than half a million people. And so we could look at something like the San Francisco Bay water, watershed as an example of that scale. And ultimately, then, you could be looking at regional scales such at the level of a state, for example. So what would happen if we had recycle at the smaller scales, and how does that affect what's happening at the scales above that? Those are kind of some of the questions that we're really interested in uh, that we're working on with this little wastewater as a resource team. So here's uh, just showing an example of a California-style water market. Here, high quality fresh water, limited availability. Let's say you have a demand for two units for the urban water. And so we supply two units. And let's suppose we have a demand for eight units for agricultural water. So we supply the agricultural water. Where does that water come from? Well, the Sierras, maybe. <laughs> and we have to transport it long distances, right? That's where we get that high quality fresh water of limited availability. And we end up discharging wastewater uh, losses or two and eight respectively to give some water balance. So now just common sense says, now what if we take that wastewater and we use a unit, instead of, uh, instead of taking that uh, and discharging it to the environment, let's say we have a unit of it that we reuse. So then what that does is it cuts down the supply that we have to import for urban water by, by half, so it's just one unit. And now we've cut down the amount we need from the the Sierra, say, for to nine units. And we could do something similar on the ag side. And if we did that, we'd cut it down to eight. And then we'd be left over with two units that we could use for something else, like, say, for example, the bay. So it's just a simple-minded approach to thinking about um, how the impacts of water reuse would scale. So what are the effects of scalping at the catchment level? If we had widespread catchment, uh, widespread scalping within these clusters in the city of Palo Alto, that would change the composition of the wastewater at the centralized facility. So if you remember uh, this picture I showed you before, if you took out three quarters of the wastewater, or if you removed three quarters of the water from the sewer, you would end up changing the value of the resource by the time it got to the centralized facility. And what you would see is that the value of the nutrients, the uh, nitrogen, the methane, and, uh, the nutrients and the methane would be um, equivalent roughly to that of the water. Okay, so we've got a different situation now at the centralized facility. So if we think about how you do that, here's our scalping facilities where we harvest water locally. And then you could imagine then that the centralized facilities would harvest water, carbon, and nitrogen. And so now we're thinking about, can we develop water balances, energy audits for the service area of the city of Palo Alto? So we've begun that process. This is an early uh, kind of picture illustrating the, the balance and what it looks like for the city of Palo Alto. Or actually, this is for Stanford and then um, showing how it feeds into the city of Palo Alto. So what you can see here is that, um, see if I can show you, ah, my pointer will work here. I'll just use this one. So here we, we import some water um, um, from San Francisco, high quality fresh water. And we also have well water and uh, and uh, surface water supplies, mainly used for irrigation. And then that water, uh, this much water goes to the city of Palo Alto. And what we can do is we can then go through and put uh, energy values on these, on these different uh, sources of water. And we can see an interesting number here, is this big huge number here for the uh, energy invested in the city of Palo Alto. So 5.55 kilowatt hours, um, in this case, for, per thousand gallons. And, and where at Stanford it's about 0.8 kilowatt hours per thousand gallons. So what's happening at the wastewater treatment plant? So this is the treatment plant as it's currently designed. This is a typical kind of uh, 60s, 70s era wastewater treatment plant, and it does its job very well. Its job, it was designed to take ammonia and, uh, and, uh, and organic matter and oxidize it. It does that. 
So it oxidizes the organic matter and that protects the bay. It takes the ammonia and the organic nitrogen and it, and it converts that into nitrate nitrogen. That's what comes out. Unfortunately, very high energy inputs are required for both for aeration and for especially this step where the solids are handled and by, by combustion in an incinerator. And we can do an energy balance on the city of Palo Alto, which we've now um, got, gotten into that a fair amount. And you can see where the major energy investments are there in the man management of the water. And uh, the big one, of course, is the incinerator, where energy in the form of natural gas has to be imported to burn the solids. Now, uh, some of you know, natural gas or methane can be produced by wastewater treatment plants. It doesn't have to be purchased by wastewater treatment plants, but here it's being purchased in large amounts. This is, um, so this is a, a place where there's some, some possibilities for improvement, significant improvement. And another place where there's a lot of investment of energy is in, in the uh, wastewater treatment, the aeration processes, the, basically supplying air. So four and 8% of the energy cost there, so 12% for operation of these bioreactors. Now over the past decade, um, there have been some great insights into microbial ecology of nitrogen removal, and they have hugely changed uh, how we, uh, the energy balance of centralized systems in Europe. Uh, previously I was showing you on the, on, the, on the Palo Alto slide, I was showing you how is nitrogen handled in Palo Alto. Right now ammonia is oxidized, and it's converted to nitrate nitrogen. That's what happens now. But we can get actually complete nitrogen removal from the water now and have it vastly improve the amount of methane that can be recovered from the organic matter. Okay? And this is due to a process called anaerobic ammonium oxidation. And this is a nod to Delft University and, uh, and, and to um, what happened in the, in the Netherlands. So they noticed that there was a, a facility there, a yeast factory, where the anaerobic treatment system um, was removing nitrogen, N2 was being produced, and it was... It was a mystery how it was being produced. And so a group at Delft did some research on it to understand the process and found that there was a new kind of uh, ecology under, that, was, uh, that was in place. And they filed a U.S. patent in uh, uh, 1992 for anaerobic ammonium oxidation. It's the Anamox process is what we now know it as. And it's been scaled up in Rotterdam. And so uh, this is one place, but there's like seven or eight facilities now uh, full, at full scale in Europe. And the result is that many of these facilities are now energy neutral. Okay, energy neutral. So when we look at the city of Palo Alto, is there a way we can rethink how things are done? So, and, and I'm just showing some options here that we're looking at. You could have uh, wastewater come in. You could have anaerobic, you could have a separation step where we concentrate the organics and then digest them to recover energy in the biogas. You could have a microbial fuel cell possibly, and by the way, we're doing some research on that with uh, Yi Kui from Material Science who's got some nanotechnology that's really cool. I won't have time to talk about that. Anaerobic processes and we get energy out. Uh, nitrogen removal, fertilizer. I'm gonna talk about how we, we now know that we can get energy out of the nitrogen removal step. We didn't know that before, but we do now. And so this would be a different uh, operation altogether than what you currently see down in the city of Palo Alto. So moreover, uh, these catchments like the city of Palo Alto, you could have, if you have distributed systems, the internet would now allow coordinated distributed operation within, within dis these uh, s scalping units, for example, or, or between adjacent service areas. Right? So we could have potentially potential for transfer of water between service areas if needed. Okay. In 2005, we began using DNA-based uh, tools for monitoring of microbial ecology at the Palo Alto Wastewater Treatment Plant. And my partner on that was Chris, who I mentioned, and George Wells is a student who played a major role in this effort. And here's some things we discovered about Palo Alto. We found that there's ammonia oxidizing bacteria varying temporally in the kinds of organisms there. Uh, some produce nitrous oxide. I'll come back to that in a second. We found that, we found that bio bioreactor microbial communities are like islands, and I'll explain what I mean by that, and that there's enormous genetic diversity at that plant, <coughs> enormous genetic diversity. So first of all, nitrous oxide, uh, that's something that uh, wastewater treatment plants are increasingly concerned about because they know they're emitting some. And we found organisms at the city of Palo Alto that can do that, and it's a serious greenhouse gas about 300 times more powerful than CO2. And so we really need to be thinking about nitrous oxide. Now fortunately, we've got the rocket scientists who've been thinking about nitrous oxide for a long time. 
So, uh, so this is Brian Cantwell, and his student came over to my office one day and said, you know, uh, we've got this process that can take nitrous oxide, and we can put it through a catalytic decomposition cell, and it will spontaneously, um, once you get it going, it spontaneously breaks down into hot air and, and gives off heat. Okay, so this is a way you could potentially run a little turbine with that. You could potentially get energy out of this reaction. And so you're saying, well, how can we get some nitrous oxide? <clears throat> and so we're, we know of bacteria, microorganisms that we can manage in bioreactors at wastewater treatment plants that can take ammonia and can convert it into nitrous oxide. And uh, so this ends up destroying the nitrous oxide, producing energy, and saves oxygen. Okay, saves oxygen. So many benefits all at once. So we've called this process can do. That actually, Brian came up with that name. Completely autotrophic nitrous decomposition operation. A little forced, a little forced. I admit it, I admit it. But you know, this is the American answer to uh, animox, the European animox. Okay, now I mentioned before that we've looked at the microbial ecology and also the diversity, uh, the gene genetic diversity of the Palo Alto plant, which by the way, I think now is probably the best studied wastewater treatment plant in the world, probably. So um, we found something like 28,000 unique functional genes using a tool developed by Jizhong Xu's lab. He, uh, Jizhong is now at the University of Oklahoma. Before that, he was at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, where this uh, tool was mainly developed. And we've applied it for our samples from the Palo Alto plant. This is showing the genetic diversity of the, of the activated sludge, the, the biomass in the, in the wastewater treatment plant at Palo Alto. Enormous genetic diversity, all these different uh, genes and, their, and what, they, what they're capable of doing. And we send people down to Central America, right, to go get genetic diversity. They should be going to the wastewater treatment plant. <laughs> so I just uh, point out that there's a lot of genetic diversity in our backyard, right, in our backyard. Okay, then I want to point out about island biogeography. Now, this picture is a little hard to explain, but what it does is, um, <laughs> this is, um, this picture's, um, these are time points. Um, if, here on the right-hand side, let's see if I can get the cursor to show up. There it is. On the right-hand side, are, these are time points, and these dots represent differences in microbial community structure. And so when two dots are close together, it means that the community structure is similar for those two dots time points, those two time points. And so you can see the city of Palo Alto, it moves around over time throughout a year. And you can see how the, the community is changing over time is what these dots are telling us. We went to Korea and we worked with collaborators in Korea and this is how a similar plant operates in Korea like that. And so, you know, we at first called this the kimchi effect and they, uh, <laughs> they, they, they thought it was more like the McDonald's effect. But differences, uh, cultural differences, and uh, differences in the kinds of organisms we're seeing. So that led us then to think about a global bioreactor network. And we even, uh, with uh, some funding from the National Science Foundation, we held a workshop in Singapore in 2006. This is a, a group of people in the workshop. We taught uh, collaborators from these locations that you see with the stars, the molecular methods we were using. And we agreed that we would try to work together to form this bio global bioreactor network. In 2008, I talked about it at a conference in Australia. And we had a whole bunch more people wanting to do this. So we've got a, a, a sort of global interest in this. Um, I'm, we're looking for the funds needed to develop the core facility. And that, uh, that's what we're looking for now. I want to finish with this last one. This is, um, we're planning now another Uncommon Dialogue on May 21st. Uh, this will be, this is the first announcement of this new Uncommon Dialogue, but I think it's safe to do. Uh, we're planning on wastewater as a resource, a focus on the Bay, San Francisco Bay. And our intent is to promote investments that will revitalize the barrier water and wastewater infrastructure. We want to improve the stability of the Bay, uh, area ecosystems. We want to inc increase the security and reliability of the freshwater supplies. We want to decrease dependence upon freshwater, imported freshwater, and increase uh, our use of renewable energy generation. And these are the sources of support that have uh, made it possible for us to do this work. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.